when it became clear that a double flap was indeed occurring in the state. <laughs> Stan Gordon was well placed to head the investigation. He claimed that between January 1st, 1973 and the end of 1974, there were 278 incidents involving either a UFO, a Bigfoot, or both. And you can call bullshit all you want, but if you read Silent what you will see is that the amount, it's just the amount a lot. of yeah. sightings, it's, wow. it's crazy. But the interesting thing is that Stan wasn't just tallying incident reports and putting a notch every time someone called up. Rather, there were 278, rather, there were 278 incidents that Gordon deemed credible, with more credence given to people who previously didn't believe in UFOs or Bigfoot. Can you buy him off? Oh, he's un unable. He's Teflon. He's already, okay. he is hired by MUFON. All right. He knows he can't mix all these strains of money, but most of it really is all done out of his own pocket. Okay. Mm -hmm. But of course, this was, as I said, back in 1973. And while UFOs certainly still ruin lives, as we've said over and over again, that statement went double in the early 70s, when one could be entirely ostracized from the community for publicly yelling, I know what I saw! Oh. Yeah. For an example of how even just telling your friends about a Bigfoot can still be perilous in modern times, here's a clip from a fairly recent Bigfoot news story in Pennsylvania in which one man openly mocks his friend on camera <laughs> when that friend tried backtracking on how much his Bigfoot sighting freaked him out. Who would do, what kind of friend would do that to another friend? Camera was not easy. <laughs> oh, wow. You go back in the woods, you see animals in the woods. Hey, I don't know where hey, this let, story let me, comes let me, from. Let me try to, let me try to jog your memory a little bit. <laughs> Damn, you better get up here. There's something up in the woods. We don't know what it is. No? Nobody, yeah, yeah, yeah. you don't remember that? Nikki, Nikki. Off <laughs> 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 he couldn't. He could not experience a. He literally couldn't experience one moment of genuine vulnerability in front of his old buddy. And which also shows that they're real old friends. Yeah. But still. Hey, man, remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Remember that? He was scared. He called up his buddy. He thought he could trust. Yeah. Remember that when you had to throw your underwear out because you shat yourself? No, remember that? Dude, I needed you to be there for me, bro. <laughs> and the guy who was telling the story, he just walks away yeah. in the middle of the interview. Just you walks die. away. Yeah, bro. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy making fun of him is a cop that is, no shit, 350 pounds. Great. Easily. Yep. Good for him. Well, interestingly, the Bigfoot did not just suddenly appear in Pennsylvania in 1973. Mm -hmm. As it is with most of the heavily wooded areas of North America, sightings of the Pennsylvania Bigfoot date back to the 1800s, when human settlements began encroaching on previously undisturbed wilderness. Mm. In one report from 1859, printed in the book Bigfoot in Pennsylvania, which was sent to us by fans Amanda and Zach, oh. a, quote, thing like a man, but hairy as a bear, was seen in a cow pen, quote, sucking the cows. See? And that's the most human of all, because he saw yeah. a thing that looked like a tit. Mm -hmm. And he went right in there. He knew, because no one would judge him like they right. judge us. No one, no one eats utter, right? Utter? Oh I don't goodness. think you want to eat utter. I, I I've never just, seen anybody eat an utter. It's just got to be rubbery. There's yeah. not can't be any. There's no flavor there. Unless you braise it. That's for oh, a, a whole it, huh? different show. Yeah. That's a whole different <laughs> show. And also, we don't have any cows. We have, we have some bulls, though. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Oh, it's all this milk. Look at all this mm. milk. Yeah. Well, that was the first reporting that okay. you ever heard for, about Bigfoots in Pennsylvania, 1859. And from there, reports of gigantic, hairy, wild men and wild women, as they were called before the Bigfoot nomenclature came into use, mm -hmm. they came continuously throughout the decades following. It's a full book, and it's just story after story, and it's news stories, it's articles. Wild man, wild man, wild man. And now we just call them moonshiners. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. But concerning the double flap of 1973, it is interesting to note that the UFOs came before the Bigfoots. Oh. This is a real mixture, and, and that's what I love about this entire story, mm -hmm. is that it is a genuine, like, and we'll keep unpacking why. Like, why is it like this? But they, it's they're all right on top of each other. Well, there's a very interesting cause and effect in play it here. But therefore, one must ask, a simple question. Yes. Were the Bigfoots piloting the UFOs themselves, hmm. or were the Bigfoots introduced by the UFOs mm. into the wilds of Pennsylvania as an experiment? Hmm. Like putting a scorpion in a shoebox with a frog 
just to see how the frog handles it. The frog would do absolutely fantastic. Chewbacca reminds me of Chewbacca. What? Are you? Sure, sure, sure. Honestly, just let him have this. <laughs> Pilot have this. in an aircraft. <laughs> well, I feel like is that that's one conversation because but what you're talking about is a fairly materialistic version of this. He's a material well, right? girl. We're going to get into the interdimensionality of this later on. Don't you worry, my friend. Because it also could just be clouds of electrons, dog. Mm-hmm. All right, and you got cold fusion. Like, that's natural cold fusion is what we're seeing, and we're mm-hmm. going to get into it. Or could it be that the UFO sightings introduced the idea of the paranormal to the area, and it wasn't too long of a leap, and it wasn't too far of a leap between UFO sightings and Bigfoot encounters? And these, of course, are the central questions of this episode. All but right, I actually feel go. like the two experiences, as we see in the accounts, are wholly different. Because the UFOs, the sightings are... Unless, far- of course, the Bigfoot uh, sighting and the UFO sighting happen at the same time, which happens a few times. But that's that's when it, they touch tips. Yeah. Because the UFO experience is way more ethereal. It's way more like... Because what people talk about when you see a UFO, it makes you question your place in the universe. It's way more of a sighting. It's more passive. Where a lot of the Bigfoot sightings, in this story especially, they're kind of aggressive. And they're way more personal and in your face. And there are more mm. up-close sightings of Bigfoots in this story than I've seen in any one of the other Bigfoot cases we've ever covered. Well, I, I would know. well, I would make a distinction here, and I do make this distinction many times, you know, over the course of this episode, is that they are UFO sightings, but Bigfoot encounters. Mm-hmm. Okay, and there we go, and that's the cornerstone of ufology and cryptozoology. You are your own research, <laughs> and then you <laughs> but that's agree the problem, dog. with yourself. But that's you are t- actually again tripping upon an essential, essential. question: yes. is that if if the paranormal, which we kind of talk about a lot of times, is a personal mm-hmm. experience, and maybe it's something that you can only see, it is so unique and it's so expressed, as was put in the book that I uh, another side book I read called Dark Matter Monsters by Simeon Hine, PhD. Ah. so he's a doctor. <laughs> yeah, he yeah. calls PhD it from. Uh, uh, oh, it says something like, oh, the, oh, it's this fe- is the- Phoenix Offline? <laughs> Phoenix Offline, <laughs> yeah. which is actually, it's incredible. It's because a cardboard box he got delivered. <laughs> to it's met a guy outside of the Hess station. Yeah, weird. Um, but he talks about it, see, it's a hidden event. Right, ah. which is like they originally coined the term "hidden event" as a way to talk about the uh, rampant child abuse in the United States. It wasn't really considered crimes so in the 1960s mm-hmm. until the 1960s. But he says it's also like Bigfoot because it's an event that happens to only you that no one will believe that happened to you because you're the only witness to the event. That's an absolutely horrendous analogy. No, yeah. no, it's exactly absolutely. the same. No, 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 it's at the top of this book. It's yeah. exactly because the same. You know, else, you know who else knows that you got molested? The guy who molested you. What do you think? The only old person that knows that you saw a Bigfoot is the Bigfoot. <laughs> Absolutely. Right? It's like, he had a person sighted. Yeah. He was just freaked out. He was probably more freaked out by you, right? <laughs> think about how the molester feels, understanding how much trouble you can get in. Yeah, we always have to think about that. I don't know. I posit, I don't know the exact timeline here. Pittsburgh Steelers. Perhaps they were just seeing Terry Bradshaw on a bender in the woods. Uh, Terry Bradshaw was a 60s player or a 70s player? I think he was the 70s. All right. I just like his hair. This is the early 70s. He doesn't have it anymore. No, none whatsoever. I think you're thinking of either Johnny United. I think you're thinking Joe Namath with the hair. Broadway Joe. Yeah. No, Terry Bradshaw. Terry Bradshaw is bald as a cue ball. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Here we go. I'm just looking at pictures of Terry Bradshaw now. He might be the Pennsylvania Bigfoot. He might be. He's only six foot three. There's also, speaking of what I know, what I saw, he was hammered one time on Jay Leno, dressed in a Santa suit, going through a divorce, openly crying because he hadn't stopped drinking yet. And I cannot find the episode anywhere that they scrubbed it. I think they might have have scrubbed it. (laughs) Yeah, it was really sad. Actually, he was at his height in 1974, but I feel like that would have made him to the Pennsylvania public. He would have been like, like, he'd be like, oh my God, it's Terry Bradshaw. Like they would freak out. Yeah. Okay. Well, the UFO sightings that preceded the year-long Bigfoot invasion of 1973 actually began in 1972. Mm. Near the end of that year, witnesses saw glowing spheres of light and metallic material falling from the sky near high-tension power lines. Cool. Very common in UFO sightings. 
Well, Kuffa Sug collected these samples. <laughs> this fucking acronym, man. <laughs> really nailed it. Difficult. I use that acronym <laughs> no, because like I'm not going to say the fucking Westmoreland County no. UFO Society <laughs> Underground. No one would. No one would. <laughs> no. And you can't say the W-U-C-U-F-O-S-U-G. <laughs> no. That doesn't make any sense. In it's no it's way, Kuffa Sug. In no way would you ever be long-winded during our the Pennsylvania UFO <laughs> Bigfoot Invasion of 1973 That's episode. That's <laughs> Well, a Kuffasug collected these samples and sent them to a lab, where it was discovered that while the metal was mostly aluminum, mostly the origin of the material was unknown. And also, this is a lot of times we yeah. see with UFO parts, right, where they go these quote-unquote metamaterials. A yeah. lot of times it is earthbound material, but they're like, but it's put in a way that no human would ever do. It's kind of like the Bill Murray thing in no, Ghostbusters. Yeah. No human no being human. would stack books like this. Yeah, yeah. Ever do that. <laughs> But it is that, where it's curious, it's the playful nature of the trickster phenomena. Right. Right? Which is, I understand, because I'm a playful trickster. <laughs> so I know what it's like, and I'm always, ooh, fiddling and fooling. Yes. So if they're like me, you can't trust them at all. <laughs> 